James, it's a pleasure to give a talk in your honor. Um, I am not an atmospheric chemist, and uh, I feel a little bit intimidated in this talk, but it seems to me that what's happened to the atmosphere over the last half century affects the ocean. Uh, perhaps there'll be some interest among your colleague about what's happening in the ocean. And so I want to congratulate you, and I want to thank the Dreyfus Foundation for everything. Um, but in the meantime, I'd like to give a very short talk because we start late and because you're going to be hungry about ocean acidification, what the atmospheric CO2 is doing to the ocean, and the marine phytoplankton who are responsible for the great productivity of the world's ocean. All right, so I'll start with the introduction of ocean chemistry, atmospheric CO2 increase. Then I'll go on to talk about the effects of the CO2 increase on photosynthesis by phytoplankton, the primary production of the ocean. Then I'll talk a little bit about the effect of pH decrease, having to do with N2 fixation and the iron bioavailability of the ocean. And finally, I'll talk about the carbonate ion effect on the calcification of coccolithophorids. Um, I didn't mean to change slides, but that's fine. Um, here is, of course, the famous killing curve showing the increase in atmospheric CO2 at Mauna Loa. And you see on the same graph, this uh, decrease in the pH of the ocean uh, going from nearly 10th of a pH unit over the last uh, 40 years or whatever. And uh, the point I want to make here is that the, um, th this decrease is, of course, uh, something that has started, has been accelerating and probably not going to stop for a while. Now, um, I put that in the context, putting on top the change in glacial interglacial carbon dioxide and the likely increase or the recent increase and the likely increase in, in the near future, 2100 or so. And with it, of course, the change in ocean pH, which also has oscillated together with uh, atmospheric CO2. And we have a decrease in the ocean pH over the last uh, 20 years anyway, probably 50 years, and projecting to something like a decrease of almost 0.3 units in pH by the year 2100. All right, so I've did some calculation taking the data of 1958 at the beginning of the Killings work and from last year. And the changes are the following. On the carbon dioxide, of course, we've gone to about more than 300 ppm to more than 400 ppm. The pH of the ocean has decreased probably less than 0.1 unit in most places. Um, and of course, CO2 in water has increased proportionally to the partial pressure of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, what's a bit more complicated, what's happening, oops, what's happening with bicarbonate, carbonate, and borate ion. Uh, carbonate and borate are the two main bases, of course, in seawater. And so they react with the CO2 that can dissolve in the ocean and they become titrated. And so both of them have become have been lowered in the ocean and they have consumed something like 20 micromolar of CO2 from part of borate, about 40 from the carbonate. And since the carbonate makes two bicarbonates, you end up with plus 100 micromolar for bicarbonate. Those are the changes in the ocean. And all of those are going to be important for what I'm going to talk about. And that is the direct effect of carbon dioxide on the photosynthesis by marine phytoplankton. All right, so let's go to very basic stuff, which is the photosynthesis reactions, the light reaction, which gathers the photons, involves oxygen out of water, passes on the electrons to the dark reaction, which makes organic matter after the CO2. The important part for me in this is this huge enzyme, Rubisco, probably the most important enzyme in the world because it's responsible for making most of the organic matter in the world, almost all of it. And this enzyme is a very large enzyme and it has a a fairly poor affinity for CO2. Remarkably, they probably evolved when CO2 was much higher in the Earth's atmosphere. And the CO2 uh, that saturates Rubisco is much, much, much higher than what's in the atmosphere or available in the surface of the ocean. So one interesting question, of course, is are we going to see 
the effect on photosynthesis by phytoplankton uh, as the CO2 increases and the pH decreases. So this is a result of many experiments in which varied the carbon dioxide and the pH independently of each other. And as a function of light, measure the growth photosynthesis by model phytoplankton species. And what you see is very, very little in the unsaturated part of the light curve. You see some noise in the saturated part, and I think it indicates that there are some effect there of the CO2. And in fact, there is evidence of that. Um, if you're in other experiments, you can see in some cases some measurable, not huge, but measurable increase in the uh, photosynthesis or growth rate of the organism. Uh, this uh, slides, which have a sort of a two dimension pH and pCO2, I'm going to use again later on. We've so experiments in which the pH and pCO2 are changed independently of each other. So the pH of H1, which is but the pH of the ocean right now, down to 7, 8, and the pCO2 from 400 to it's 800 at microatmosphere. So those, doing those things independently turns out to be important for understanding what's happening to the organisms in the ocean. All right, so what we've seen is not very much of an effect on uh, primary production. And that was a sort of a, maybe a bit strange because you might think that uh, this poor enzyme, that uh, which is uh, not saturated, is going to be affected. But in fact, what happens in phytoplankton is a, is a huge concentration of carbon dioxide from the inside through a series of transport systems that I want to detail and multiplying the outside concentration, which is a bit more than 10 micromolar now, to more than 100 micromolar at the site of fixation inside the perinoid, which is a small organelle inside the chloroplast. And so if you think about that, when you're going to increase, let's say, the CO2 from 10 to 20, uh, the most you can expect in terms of the advantage of the gradient is going to be increased by 10%. And all the work, of course, is in the gradient. So doubling the CO2, in fact, cannot do much more than a few percent, maybe up to 10% effect on the growth of phytoplankton. That's an important effect, but it's not a huge effect. Now, let me go to another issue, which is that of the pH decrease on the phytoplankton. And there I want to look at two particular nutrients, nitrogen and iron. And the reason I want to talk about them is because they're the major limiting nutrients in the ocean. So if you're talking about nitrogen, you probably want to deal with what's going to bring new nitrogen in the ocean. So is a sort of a made up map of the oceans and what are the limiting nutrients in the ocean. And you see nitrogen having large sections, okay, of the ocean on either side of the equator. And you see iron being the dominant limiting nutrient in most of the rest of the world, okay? So I'll start with the nitrogen and talk about a dominant cyanobacterium in terms of the fixation of N2 from uh, into the ocean, making up for the loss of fixed nitrogen by other organism. And this organism is called Trachodesmium. It's a, it's a ubiquitous organism around the equator. And um, you'll find here different forms of it. And I'll talk mostly about the single trichome, which is the dominant form of the organism. And I want to go back to, to, to the problem of enzymes here. Nitrogenase is again a huge enzyme, does a very difficult job. And what I want to underline is this effect of the reduction of, it, of protons into hydrogen, which is indispensable for the functioning of the enzyme. And I think that's going to be important to us. Now, here again is my two dimensional graphs in terms of <clears throat> the effect of pH and CO2. You're taking this organism and you increase the carbon dioxide. And what you see is what you might expect, which is an interesting and sizable effect on the growth rate. Again, because they again use Rubisco and Rubisco is, you can make less Rubisco and go faster if you actually increase the CO2. Now, if you just decrease the pH, you see a fairly sizable decrease in, in, in growth. And, and what you see if you do a study of all the proteins inside the cells, it, you'll see there's much more proton pumping across the, 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 the membranes, the outside membranes of the cells. 
And, but you see that, in fact, there's a need for much more ATP as a result and not as much being produced. Now, if you look at the whole thing, looking at the four dimensions, what you see that the increase, which is about the, about the 20 percent decrease in growth rate, going from non-acidified to acidified conditions at, let's say, four, from 400 to 800 microatmosphere. So the effect of the low pH is actually much larger than the effect of the high carbon dioxide. All right, so if you look at that in terms of the dimensions and look at the organism, uh, you see the effect on the, <coughs> on, the, on the rate of N2 fixation, which is essentially identical to the rate of, the, of the growth of the organism. But what's very interesting is to see that there's a huge increase in nitrogenase enzyme in the organism. They make it 50% more sometimes. And what you see that the internal pH is decreasing enormously. And what's happening really is that you end up with an organism that is not really controlling its internal pH very well and unable to really control it to the point where nitrogenase can function efficiently. And, and that's a, a dramatic effect on N2 fixation in this important organism. All right. So N2 fixation is obviously affected by, by acidification. Let's talk about the availability of iron. And the reason why iron is important is because, again, it is limiting the productivity of the ocean in equatorial regions and also in higher, in higher latitudes. So here is an important experiment because the question is really is, is the effect of pH going to be on the physiology of the organism or on the availability of the iron, which is often limiting growth? So it's an experiment with a, using EDTA and a and, and few organisms, in this case, two of them. And what you see is a very large effect of pH, uh, 7, 8, 8, 2, 8, 6. You see very large differences in the rate of, uh, of the uptake of, of iron per day. And, but if you recalculate everything as a function of the unculated iron, all the data falls in the same line. And that's been done with other organisms and other complexing agents. So the point there is that the main effect of pH on the iron nutrition is not on the physiology of the organism, but on the availability of the iron in the ocean. So you have two examples of model compounds that bind iron, EDTA, which I showed them before in the data, and you take another compound like a biscategrulate, like acetylcholin, which of course has not very much response to pH in the range of interest, and you see no effect of pH. So that's a really a demonstration that the pH effect is not on the physiology of the organism. Nonetheless, if you go, and by the way, we don't know what the complexing agents of iron and seawater, it's a complicated business, so I'm not going to go into a deep hole on that, but what you see in direct experiments, and there are many of those, and they will be different from each other. This is not a log scale anymore, so it is, and the changes are not very large. As you acidify seawater, you see a slight decrease in, in, the, in this case, in the iron uptake rate. You, same thing sometimes in growth rates. Uh, the effect is not significant from between uh, above eight. And it becomes a little bit significant, a bit below eight. Insignificant it really is, it will depend on a number of things. And here is an interesting link to atmospheric chemistry because I, the question is to me, in fact, is the acidification of the eye of the, of the seawater, of surface seawater, would that possibly increase the availability of the iron that is transported by the atmosphere and is, is, is given to the surface seawater? Some of it is not very active, but it become more reactive because of acidification. All right, so I promised a very short talk, so I'm going to go directly into the effect of coprolithophorids and the effect of the carbonate concentration decrease. So that's been measured in various stations, uh, like bats in the, in the Bermuda, Aloha in Hawaii, and Estop, which is the European station which is just a little bit off of uh, Africa. Um, all of those show a decrease in, in CO2 in carbonate ion concentration. Of course, it's a shorter uh, experiment so far. And I want to talk about 
the coccolithophorids, which are the most important calcifiers in the ocean. There are many other organisms that make calcium carbonate. Some of them make calcite, some of them make aragonite. But basically, the one that does the real job uh, are the, are the coccolithophorids, the phytoplankton, and they have just little plates of calcium carbonate, of calcite, really, uh, attached to them. And sometimes they get rid of them, sometimes they don't make them, but they are the one doing most of the precipitation of calcium carbonate in the ocean. And here is a little map, which is, I think is important. Uh, calcium carbonate is super saturated in the ocean, calcite by factors of five, sometimes higher, uh, aragonite by less, and it becomes unsaturated at depth. So the calcite falls down and then dissolves and, is, and the material is brought back by current as dissolved material. So there is a whole important cycle of calcium carbonate forming in the surface, falling toward the bottom, dissolving, and being recycled to the top by, by mixing of the ocean. And here are some data. There are other data, but I think this is a particularly interesting uh, paper by Rubicell, in which he measured the effect of, at the same time, the change in CO2 in pH and carbonate ion concentration. And here you see the effect on the Actually, the growth of the cells, uh, particulate organic carbon is really how much biomass is being made. And you see again this positive effect of the increase of CO2 in the, in, in, in the culture. Okay, this from 200 to 800, 800 is high, but nonetheless, you can measure significant increase in the in, in growth rate effectively. I want to mention that. When you do field experiments, often that increase in growth is not visible for whatever reason. In lab experiments, you know, normally see it. And by the way, we don't know what calcification does, so it's hard to decide what cause, what, what's causing things in the ocean compared to, to beakers. But what you see also is a very large decrease in calcification. I should have mentioned that those are two organisms that are important in the ocean. Eoxidai is the the most dominant coccolithophorid in the ocean. And you see very sizable decrease in calcification. So the, the net result is by the interesting, uh, the main reaction to make calcium carbonate is of course calcium working with bicarbonate and making the calcium carbonate is going to drop down in the ocean and the CO2, which is recycled into the atmosphere. So when you do less calcification, what happens is that you increase the CO2 storage of the ocean because you decrease the calcium carbonate precipitation. And what you're doing also is you don't decrease the pH of seawater as much, uh, which is interesting. So that in fact is a feedback, which is in fact uh, good against acidification of the ocean. And so I'm gonna conclude my talk very, very briefly. So the main results of, of, of what have been done, I think, so far, and it's a lot of papers, it's about a thousand papers a year right now dealing with ocean acidification. Um, there is a significant slight decrease in photosynthesis, and I think we can expect the organisms that take advantage of the increased CO2 to become more important, uh, some to adapt to that, and I think we're going to see a slight increase in the, in the rate of photosynthesis in the ocean, which I think is a good thing because it means more taking up of CO2. There seemed to be an important decrease in nutrient fixation by cyanobacteria. That's a worrisome thing. I don't know if it's going to be completely confirmed. It's been confirmed by another species, an important species of cyanobacteria. Um, might they change, might they adapt, I don't know. But right now, the data that are collected both in labs and in the field show a decrease in nutrient fixation uh, in, in the ocean. Since nutrient fixation is important to make up the lost nitrogen by denitrification, and that's maybe an important thing. Um, the decrease in iron bioavailability, which we have seen, which is not very large, I'm not convinced will be important simply because it might depend really on whether there's a change in the supply of iron to the surface ocean. And people who work in the atmosphere probably know more than I do on this subject. Um, finally, oops, there is clearly a decrease in calcium carbonate precipitation by coccolithophore, and the net result is a somewhat less acidification for CO2 dissolved. 
that has not been seen so far. Like as far as I can tell, there's been no change in the alkalinity of the ocean. You look at the data and there's no measurable change in the alkalinity of the ocean. But at some point, it may become really significant and make a really a, an interesting negative feedback in terms of ocean acidification. What do I do? I'm sorry. And I've done a very, very short talk because I thought you bought one before lunch. Uh, James, it's been a pleasure to get to know you. Um, I hope you have a great time. Uh, by the way, I dressed up the way you normally do, which is a blue blazer and a, and a polo shirt. I presume you're going to be much more dressed up today at the ACS meeting. But I, I, it's been a great pleasure to get to know you. And it's a great pleasure to be invited to this talk. Thank you very much for a very nice talk.